Hi everyone, this is YMP TV and as you know, we've been doing those interviews in the spirit of quarantine and COVID-19 where we talk to CEOs about their thoughts on what's going on in the market and how it has been impacting them. So today we have Re Dev Randawa, the CEO and chairman of Fission Uranium. Hi Dev, thanks for joining us. Oh, well, thanks for having me, Anka. So like before we start, I guess I'll ask you the big question that I've been asking everyone. How has COVID-19 impacted your company and I guess like impacted the supply and demand of, of uranium? When, when I spoke to, to John Bev, he told, we discussed about like the Kazakhstan shutting down their operation, Cameco in Canada, I guess like announced the suspension of their, their operation as well. So can you tell us a bit more about sure. it as well? Well, yeah. I mean, obviously I think, um, you know, it's sad, first of all, the human toll that COVID-19 has brought. Um, so I think, first of all, as humans, nobody wants to see uh, the humans pass. You know, But having said that, as investors, the two big winners in this cycle, obviously gold, because they're printing money, you know, um, trillions and trillions. It's, real, it's like no one's even talking about those numbers anymore. Uh, but secondly, uranium, because um, about 54% of the world's productions uh, shut down. The CAGS has cut back, Cigar Lake went down, uh, Husab and, uh, and, and certainly in, uh, in Africa, you've got, you know, mines that were shut down. And so, uh, and normally that wouldn't be a problem, to be honest, if people were disciplined in our market. Um, but unfortunately, like Fukushima didn't drop the demand for uranium. It's actually more reactor being built today than ever. But the difference is, um, it's the way contracting is done. I believe, from my uh, perspective, the uh, Japanese uh, were very disciplined. And so some of that's left. And so people have been counting on the short, on the spot price, the short term market to provide for their needs. Um, so uh, unfortunately, half of that's gone. So uranium has shot up about 30, uh, 35%. And I think it's in Bloomberg talks about it. I think Forbes has talked about it. It's catching people off guard. <clears throat> it's catching people off guard because the utilities weren't ready. They always thought they could live off the spot market. When I began my career 24 years ago in uranium, um, the most of the uranium was bought and sold on long-term contracts and very little was actually traded on the spot. But now, I think it was 2018, half of the uranium that was traded, 180 million, half the 90 million was short-term. So, yeah, so I think um, what this has done is expose the weakness of, of, this, of this kick the can down strategy that utilities have had. So the prices have gone up. I mean, not just us, but look at chemical, it was around $12, I can't remember, before COVID, and now it's 15. So it's up 25%, yet they shut down their operations. And so, and same with us, we're higher than we were then. and. Uh, so it just tells you that, you know, uh, I would call it a white swan event, you know, these kinds of things. Um, so, yeah, we're very fortunate that uh, us, you know, John and uh, David Cates and Dennison and Lee and all, all the guys were all obviously happy that uranium prices are up. It's sad that, that there's a human toll to COVID as well. And just we'll, we'll back up a little bit and step away from, from COVID-19 just because I think it's going to be interesting for our listeners and, and I guess our members out there to hear more about your background and a bit about the company's history. I mean, first of all, you're the, one of the longest standing CEOs of the same company since like you've been CEOs of, of Fission Uranium since 1996 and um, the company sure. has been split up more than one time. So can you sure. tell us a bit more about it? Yeah, I mean, sure. It's, it's funny, you know, the whole thing started with a, a buddy of mine named Rich uh, Newberry. He says he ran to a guy in an elevator and a couple of old folks who want to talk uranium. And I said, what the heck is that used for? Like everybody else, I thought that was for weapons. I had no idea the role that 20% of the power from the U.S. all came from nuclear or what role it played in France and things like that. Um, and um, so that, I remember phoning a buddy. I said, how do you spell it? And he goes, well, it's actually a pretty good place. Well, it's my friend Scotty at the time. We looked at it and it had a, a heck of a run because uranium went from 7 to 17. A company called Orbent went, went bankrupt. They couldn't supply, so it ran up. 
then it ran back down again with Reax. And it was really till 2003 and four you started to see this, um, you know, you don't have to be a mathematician. The supply kept going this way and demand kept going this way. Um, so eventually in 2005 to seven, you saw uranium go from teens up to 140, 10 times. Um, and uh, it happened like that. So little companies like ours, um, so when I started, I went to a guy which I would knew was one of the smartest guys in the street was uh, Rick Rule. And Rick backed us and he gave me some help to invite some other better guys to the board who knew the uranium business, not just the gold business. So we had a you know, heck of a run in Strathmore from one, you know, 1. 1.6 million market cap to half a billion nearly. Um, near the top of it, some wisdom from a smart guy like Peter Groskopf said, why don't you take the assets in Strathmore, put the Canadian ones over here and the U.S. ones here. And so we split off a company called Fission Energy with all the Canadian assets. Um, just before that, we had in Strathmore been able to uh, attract Sumotomo to come help us develop Roca Honda. And so um, that's, we got them in. That was fascinating to go to Japan, obviously, as a you know, kid growing up in Northern BC. Um, and we finished that and as soon as we start that, we got lucky that Hathor hit next to us and Korean Electric Power Company was our partner. So it was a crazy times. Um, so we, so basically if you look in your account today, if in 2007 you own a share of Strathmore, you don't own energy fuels, you own a, some shares in Denison, shares in uh, Fission 3.0 and Fission Uranium we're talking about. Does, I've owned some of my shares for 24 years. So. Uh, we've got a pretty long-term view, and you've seen a lot, and you had crisis after crisis. Um, most of them weren't good ones. I mean, this is a crisis that turned out well, but, you know, even our stock got crushed down to 10 cents before people realized, uh-oh, uranium is now it's almost up four times. So, yeah, it's been a crazy uh, few years, but uh, we were very lucky along the way to Sprott was really the group with Eric Sprott and that team of guys that felt, uh, really behind the uranium space, Rick did. So yeah, those are pretty crazy times. And you've seen a lot, you've seen uh, companies come and go. I, I think, give an example of how crazy it can get in a uranium bull market. I think there used to be like, um, I kid you not, um, five companies. I remember, I think it was 2005, uh, a, a young man named Jamie Strauss was trying to find all the uranium companies in the world and felt it was the place to be because based on a chat with Brian Dalton, so there's only five of us. That's all there was, right? Uh, Lucas's group, uh, Will Hochstein, uh, Neil Froman, us, uh, and Brian Bolton. Um, but within, uh, I kid you not, within a year, there were 954 uranium companies around the world. 954. Because there was so much money going into it. Um, you know, unfortunately, the credit crunch crunch and and it kind of the other way. So yeah, it's been a fascinating few years. Uh, so like I said, some of our shares I've got, I've had for 24 years. And I guess like, what would you tell an investor who's new to uranium? Like why invest in uranium? Well, you know, let's step back. I think that um, you gotta, I think if we want to live in a real world of facts, I don't know how you can possibly talk about a greener planet without uranium because uh, even if you've seen this latest Michael Moore uh, movie, uh, he talks about, he just absolutely debunks this whole green thing. It's uh, how silly it is. They'll talk about, oh yeah, we got so much money, so much from, from renewables. No, 95% of that is biomass, which is cutting down trees, burning forests. I, I fail to understand how that's renewable. Trees are not renewable. Um, and it's a big, that's so when they talk renewables, they lump into it, sometimes even natural gas. So they can say, oh, look at renewables. And they're trying to track money over to the wind, to wind and sun. But the problem is they're not reliable. And, and if you also look at, um, for example, how solar panels are even made, they're not from sand, they're from coal and something else. Coal. Like, so I, I think it's been a, a great um, marketing job but it's really not true that you like uh, Bill Gates says, what other energy is there that's reliable, baseload, you can turn it on and off. And it's, 
and a year of can a year of waste of a nuclear plant that's inside a Pepsi can. So, you know, you can't talk about it. It's got to be in that mix. So, I think first thing I would do is encourage people: educate, educate, educate. Um, learn about what is true, what is green energy, what is not green energy. Um, it's because you know, in the next 15 years, we need 75% more energy, I'm told, electrically. You know, I don't know about you, what do you do at night? Plug things in at night, everything's plugged in. Um, uh, and so uh, what's weird is people, you know, people in Western Canada, oh, I've got a green car, electric. Yeah, but your power's coal. Okay? So the hypocrisy is a bit uh, hard to swallow at times, people saying they're going green. Um, so anyways, I, I think we need power. Where is it going to come from? We need lots of electric energy. The, the middle, the masses in China and India are keep growing. They need energy. Where is it going? Where is green energy? So I think it's a great future for uranium. And you certainly see the way China is going about it. They see it. Um, so I think educate yourself. And if you decide you want um, stocks in the uranium space, you need to look at, I'm not, a, I'm not an advisor, but I would certainly talk to an advisor and see what fits your profile for risk. If you don't like much risk, you might want to buy a chemical yellow cake or you know a uranium participation fund UPC or you say okay I want to take a shot on uh, at a developing company that might be us you know if you want to take a discovery at a you know brand new from start you might take vision 3.0 um, because of the model that is so I think once they educate themselves on what energy is your green energy is where your radio fits in then do your homework and what kind of risk level you want to take or you want a basket I don't know, but um, but I think Rick Rule's a great place. I think that anybody in the junior business game um, has to has to spend time with you know one of your very first guests. I was very smart of you um, to talk to him. Uh, he's been investing on his own for years and years, and he's a no frills investor. He's always thinking about how do I protect my downside, and that's what. He does very well than anybody I know. Um, that's why you'll say do financings. So you need to either be close to these companies or work with uh, work with funds and Sprott and etc. Who know how to get good deals for you. They do the homework for you, right? And they're incentivized to do so. And I think Rick's very good at it. I agree. I agree. I think it was great interviewing Rick. I mean, he has great like an insightful comments. Uh, so I was very happy. So thanks, Rick. Um, just because you've been in position for a long time, uh, you, uh, you've seen more than one crisis. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us a bit more how you manage as, I guess, like a mining executive, uh, different crisis and, and, and maybe as a yeah. mining investor as well? Sure. Well, you know, um, it, you tend to be, you, you, I would say an old adage, you hope for the best and plan for the worst. You do try that. Um, you know, so, you know, a couple of years ago, we had to, we realized that, you know, the arena market was when we started shut down our Vancouver office. Part of it was that our main guy left for a greener, uh, got an 8% raise, so I don't blame him. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, he was there, and so that cut us back. So you got to, crises generally uh, usually mean, um, also mean opportunities. The Chinese word for crises, Doug Casey will tell you, also means opportunity. So you can buy, but when things are out of favor, you can buy. Um, stuff right if you if you if you really like gold and then and gold falls buy some of your favorite stocks so in a crisis can turn for you uh, but you know we've had lots of those you know um you know but you hope that you're good you're well financed you hope you've got a good team around you at the end of the day you've got a world-class asset and they can you know people can do whatever but when you've got an asset like which we haven't talked about what makes Fission's um, uh, triple R deposit that amazing? Um, because it's a unicorn, you know. You just you just don't. I don't know when next time someone will find one. If it is, it'll be Ross. I mean, Ross won the Prospect of the Year award based on it. Is because when I got in the business, um, people said if you want shallow deposits, go to Africa. They're low grade, tough jurisdiction. Uh, but if you want the best deposits, you've got to go come to Canada. But when they said that, they said you got to the Athabasca, but stay on the east side, Cigar Lake, MacArthur, are all there. That's the holy grail. But you know what? As, uh, how, how does Goliath get beat? Um, 
because David, in this case, Ross, went to the West side and said, we believe there's uranium there, but we're not going to spend years putting people on the ground. They took an airplane with high resolution um, and went along looking for boulders sitting on top or outcrops of uranium. We believe there are shallow deposits and we believe they can be anywhere. So we did the whole rim and that's where we found the boulders on Triple R with some help, traced up the where it would be. And so what makes the deposit, not only is it just large, high grade, Canada, it also has no um, sandstone on top. One of the concerns people always have with Cigar Lake was what caused the problem was there's sandstone, it's like a milkshake. Well, in this case, the glaciers are wiped off and you've got this hard rock, which just makes it much easier to mine. So that's the one advantage it has over others in the in industry. Second advantage is 50 meters from surface. Um, you know, when you go down to 500, there's just more technical risk. So that's why this project won as many awards as it has, is because it's um, no sense, don't, close to the ground, and in Canada, high grade uh, and large. So it, that's what makes this project very unique. And that's why, you know, um, grade matters, jurisdiction matters. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, who's going to take it out? Um, you know, I, I think the industry is due for a consolidation. We haven't had one for a while, but there's been no need. The market wasn't rewarding it. So you might see the Oranos back. Uh, you might see some of the Rios back. I don't know. You know, uh, you have to remember this industry, biggest players for a long time were oil companies. If you, look, if you go back into the States, uh, oil companies were huge in uranium. <clears throat> then they're not. So it's a tough industry. Our pricing isn't transparent and we don't have a lot of uh, big companies like Campbell sitting around waiting to buy others. So it's, it's a unique industry. Um, but you know, like all mining people, you know, we're all, we're all pretty tough. We're pretty things with thick skin because we have to be, because you can constantly see these up and downs. You're, when things go down, you got to cut costs. When things go up, you got to attract people. So, it's about, um, you know, when things, prices drop, you try to buy assets. When prices go up, you try to sell them. It's like any other, I mean, I guess I think I mentioned to you uh, in passing that our strategy corporately has really been a part of Rick rule. Like Rick always says, you're a victim or you're a contrarian, pick one. And so we've always tried to buy assets when prices are down or stake. Um, and the other thing is, is we've tried to and successfully take our idea, develop it, and then bring in a partner. We did it in um, Roka Honda with the Japanese Somotomo. With um, Waterbury, we did it with a Korean Electric Power Company uh, from Seoul. And now recently we've done it with uh, CGN, which is about half the, ha controls about half the, uh, the Chinese market. And I call them the mothership of the industry because they're the only ones left that actually mine, uh, build reactors, and do it all. Uh, as a company. So uh, we're really lucky to have them. And uh, so we did that. We put up so much money, but they put in the bigger money. So, and that's kind of a, one of Rick's, you know, ideas is to spread the de-risk projects, bring in large groups in. And Dev, as a mining executive, what would you tell a young professional starting its career in this period of crisis or even those joining the industry? Well, the mining industry is fantastic. You're going to find risk takers. Um, and, and with a really colorful people, although I think we're losing more and more colorful people. Uh, when I got in the business of Murray Peasums and, uh, you know, some of these guys, uh, whether you agreed how they do business or not, they were larger than life. And we certainly have lost a lot of that. Um, but I, I think that, you know, if you don't grow it, it has to be mined. Remember that. If you can't grow it, it has to be mined. And, Whatever you've got, whether it's, you know, our laptops, our fireplaces, but we ha all those products have to be mined. And so um, I think, especially in Canada, it's a big part of who we are as our mining industry, especially in Quebec, you know. Uh, yeah. And so um, it's like hockey, you know, um, in our country. So I would say don't run from it. And, um, but there's room for everybody. There's room for extroverts to do MBAs and finance and go into banking. If you rather work alone, you want to be in the field, there's room for that. 
Um, yeah, so I, I just say look at it. Don't, you know, prejudge it. Do your homework. Don't think mining, you know, see a guy with a beard, although we have a lot of those guys. <laughs> and I don't blame them when it's 40 below. I, I would have a beard too. I would be <laughs> shaving. Um, so we do have that. But I say be open-minded and uh, you'll find some really colorful people because you've got to have really, really thick skin to be in our industry, right? And um, and be creative. That's how Ross and our team didn't go in the industry and they said, and everybody says, oh, don't go to the, don't go to the west side of the basin. There's nothing there. There's no shallow deposits left. Everything's going to be deep. Well, you know, challenge. Challenge the norm. And that's what Ross and the guys did and found, uh, you know, even today's mark is worth $200 million. So. And I guess like on a positive note, we'll come out of this crisis as well, like as we have with other crises in the field. Absolutely. Oh, sure. I mean, I, I, like when you have loss, you may not, you'll, may not get over it. You'll get through it, right? Um, is the world going to change? Yeah. Is it the end of the handshake? I don't know. Um, is it the end of hugging? I don't know. Um, you know, I don't know if, uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure going forward, every restaurant will have more places to wash your hands when you come in and when you leave. Um, I can see the way food is prepared. I can see that. I can see a lot of change. Just like 9-11 changed the way we flew. You know, we got to take our shoes off or, you know, uh, can't take liquids with us anymore. Not that they're big deals, but there are changes, right? And over time, it'll soften back off. But uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what happens. Uh, I'm told today barbershops are opening, which if I was, in the, if I was down in uh, Scottsdale, I could do that. Uh, restaurants are opening Monday, but 50% capacity. So they're, you know, we got to keep in mind there's 30 million people, 3 million people in Canada, sorry, 2 million people in Canada have lost their jobs that we know of. Yeah. Um, who's, if, you're, if, you're living, if you're walking under the table, if they're working on the table, you're, and so that's quite a, I'm not trying to say, you know, compare lives to that, but I'm saying a lot of people are really suffering, um, maybe not physical health, but mental health and financial health. Um, you know, it, this is, the, the impacts of this is going to be felt for some time, sadly. And before we end this interview, do you have any last piece of advice for investors out there, <laughs> including millennials um, members? Like, Sure. Well, again, to do your homework. Um, yeah. You know, but you, you know what, I don't know about you, when I was in university, I wasn't dumb, but I wasn't the smartest kid because I was in a technical program. I mean, but you know, you got to find who the smart guys are and hang out with them and learn, you know, and you can ask them questions. Same in our industry. Um, go online, check out Rick Rule. Um, you know, uh, he's pretty centered and he's, he's allowed to give advice. I can't. Um, Listen to the Ross Beatties like you. And, you know, these, these guys are smart, smart guys. And uh, they have seen the ups and downs. And I, I like him. Eric Sprott does a great chat on uh, Friday mornings, I think, Sprott Money. That's always a fascinating early morning chat. So just educate yourself. I mean, the best, uh, you know, to make the best decisions, you need the best information. But a lot of time, that's not in our heads. It's outside. So Whoever has the best information generally makes the best decision. So the real task is learn, be patient. Um, and, you know, hopefully, unfortunately, people love investing online now. I'm, I always like talking. I still have brokerage accounts because I like talking to somebody and making sure I'm not have a weird idea, you know, and they hopefully tell me, like I was, you know, thinking of selling some gold stocks and the guy says, my buddy Brian says, don't do it. And he was right. That stock's gone up 40% since then. So even I, as a guy, can, I can learn from everybody. And everybody, and that's the online trading is good. I get it. But you got to make sure that you're checking these ideas through a filter. Well, thank you, Dev, for this interview. I mean, it was great. It was great information, great answers. So thank you very much. I think we really appreciate it. And take care. Thank you for your time. Have a wonderful day.